Hello and welcome to today's devotion. We are um, looking in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses uh, 8, blah, 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 verses 11 through 12 at least, perhaps more. And the focus today is on hearing God's voice. When we talked last devotion in verses 8 through 10, we talked about the two different realms and that they are not exclusive. We're going to talk about that more as we go into um, the scriptures today. But the focus will be on hearing God's voice. So let's pray. We'll get into it. Thank you, Father, for drawing our attention once again to your word. And we do ask because we need your spirit to reveal it to us. We simply cannot understand it or realize the truth therein unless your spirit reveals it to us. And so as we go into your word today, Lord, please open up our hearts and minds to hear what you have to say in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 11, whenever they bring you before synagogues and rulers and authorities, don't worry about how you should defend yourselves or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour, key phrase, what must be said. Now, previously we talked about the two different realms that they're they're connected. In other words, Jesus says it this way. If you acknowledge me before others in this realm, this is where you acknowledge him, is in this realm. When you do that, I acknowledge you in the heavenly realm. And if you deny me in this realm, I deny you in that realm. The two realms were never designed to be separated. And in reality, they are separated only for a period that we know of as time. Eternally, they are not. And that's not something I'm going to get into right now, but it is something to bear in mind. That the spiritual realm and the physical realm are intended to and will eventually be whole. They will be one. It's why Paul says in his letter to the Ephesian church that Jesus is bringing things together in heaven and on earth. Bringing them together. Now, In understanding what Jesus is saying here, it is important to understand the context of who we are. The only way to know who we are is to look in the mirror known as God's word. God's word is a mirror that allows us to see ourselves for who we are. It's why I think it's James that says, uh, don't for, if you're not a doer of the word, it's like somebody looking in a mirror and seeing themselves and then turning away and forgetting what they look like. It's the same reality with regards to scripture and understanding who we are spiritually as well as physically. So understanding that you go to the beginning of Genesis where God is creating us and creates us first from the ground of the earth, the dust of the ground, if you will. So we're physical. In fact, when we die, we go back to being minerals again, and it doesn't take that long. But as we read, God breathes into Adam, the man of dust. He breathes into him and man becomes a living being. So in God breathing, he gives us his spirit. In fact, the word for breath and spirit is the same. Ruach. And it's also the same in Greek, pneuma. In breathing into us, he gives us his spirit. And we become what the scripture refers to in Hebrew as an afesh or a soul. So we've got three parts to who we are. This is very, 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 very important to understand. Because in modern day psychology, (laughs) one part is completely left out. That's like if psychology 
and you go to a psychologist and they say, okay, we're going to work on your problems, but they're not going to take into account your physical surroundings. Let's say you, you, you just, I don't know, you, you are dealing with um, abuse, physical abuse, let's see, something physical, and they just completely ignore it because they, they don't acknowledge that it exists. You cannot address a human being without understanding who they truly are. And so we have spirit, soul, and body. And the spirit is what connects us to or gives us the ability to have fellowship with God, oneness with God. Jesus says the true worshipers will worship God in spirit, not in soul, in spirit. When he's talking to the woman at the well, it's a profound statement. He says to the woman, woman, you're not going to worship in Jerusalem. In other words, it does not depend on your physical body and its location. You worship, he also says, what you do not know, because they're a Samaritan and they don't have the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures beyond the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. Whereas the Jews have all of the prophets that speak of him. And so he says, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We Jews worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. This is where he is referring to the soul. Knowledge, scriptural knowledge, historical knowledge, revelatory knowledge that is in scripture is meant to engage our soul. It's very helpful. It is imperative that we know this. So this is what Jesus is referring to in speaking with this woman. That you, in your soul, you don't have enough knowledge. Because God has revealed himself through the history of Israel. So Israel has knowledge about God. We worship what we do know, not who. He says to her, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. This refers to the soul because it's knowledge about God. And then he moves to the spiritual realm. Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And this is how, this is him referring to the re- generation of our spirit, our spirit that is still there, but it is dead. And through his Holy Spirit, it's regenerated. And we are able to have communion and oneness and fellowship with God once again. Now it's not complete. It happens on an individual, personal level. And it transforms our heart while we're still in this world. It begins to restructure our soul, and that process is called sanctification. It's a big word, but it's a process simply meaning his spirit is in the business of <clears throat> realigning our soul the way it was originally intended. And that process on our part is called repentance. So, when Jesus says, Whenever they bring you before synagogues and rulers and authorities, don't worry about what, how you should defend yourselves or what you should say. This, by the way, is not limited to this. He is giving them a specific situation or instance that they will find themselves in shortly where they're, they are under threat of persecution by religious authorities. But that is one type of, of stress that they will deal with directly. We may not have that kind of stress. But whatever stress we find ourselves in, in this world with regards to various authorities in our lives, we don't have to worry because, as he says, the Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour what must be said. Now, this is a very profound teaching in and of the fact that we generally live most of our lives in the future. We do not live our lives in the present very much. We live our lives according to the clock. When you wake up in the day, I'm going to guess that most of your mind's attention is given to what the day's going to look like. 
and what you're probably going to experience and who you're going to run into and what you're going to do and what you may eat and your plan. We call them plans. That's generally what we draw our attention to and give our attention to and spend an enormous amount, enormous amount of time thinking about. It's also where worry comes in. It's not the first time Jesus says not to worry with regards to food and clothing and so forth. He also says, don't worry. But who we are as human beings, separate from the spirit, this is where our mind goes to, our soul. Our soul is where we think, is where we have feelings, where we have desires. And those things bounce back and forth. And so we generally spend most of our time in our soul planning for the future. But Jesus makes a very um, imperative teaching when he says that very hour, the Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour what must be said. In other words, you can only hear God's voice in the present. In as much as your soul is concerned about the future, which you never live in, because once you get there, you're into the next future. You're just constantly watching a movie screen in, the, in your mind that you've made up about your future. It's like having your own screenwriter guild in your head planning out your life. And it chokes out, if you will, the very voice of the Holy Spirit. However, as we learn to surrender our lives, and Jesus says this with regards to repentance, unless you pick up in cr your cross and follow me daily, which means you take your soul and rather than having your soul direct you, you offer it to God fully and completely. And you teach the soul to be subservient to the spirit in, in as much as it's able to be quiet, and stop projecting into the future and listen to what God is saying in the moment. Or as Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom. It's another way of saying it. Seek you first. You don't seek the kingdom in your soul. You can, you can seek information about the kingdom, sure, but you ultimately seek it with your spirit. So the, the ability to hear God's voice is directly linked to our ability to be in the present. Scripture is filled with instances of God speaking to various people, nations, prophets, throughout the generations. But when they heard his voice, they heard it in the present. When Adam heard God's voice, he heard it in the present. When Abraham heard God's voice, he heard it in the present. When Isaac or Jacob or Joseph heard God's voice, he heard him in the present. And even though they are recorded so that we can glean insight into his promises and his salvation and the spiritual revelation of who he is, we still can only hear God for our lives in the present. So we may not be called before synagogue rulers, but we'll be called before somebody. We may not be called before authorities, but we'll be called before somebody. And when that happens, as we learn to live in the spirit, in the present, the Spirit literally gives us words. Um, it's, a, it's a profound, profound thing. I'm going to give an experience of that next. Well, I'll just give you a quick experience. I was visiting with someone in the hospital recently, and I wanted to pray with that person, but there were other people in the room, and it was just in my spirit again. It wasn't time, so I just waited. Now, my soul can get caught up in the clock and time to leave and how much time was spent, all this kind of stuff. That's a soul activity. But my spirit was simply saying, wait. So I didn't. And God opened up a window in which it was just me and that one person. And when I started praying with that one person, while they may at the time not be able to speak at all, they were able to speak in that moment and speak clearly. 
And then I went in and started praying in the spirit, which is something different as a gift. And that person fell asleep and hadn't been asleep for quite a while. This is what Jesus is talking about, being in the present moment for the spirit to speak. Thank you so much for tuning in. Next time, we'll pick it up with verse 13. Until then, may the peace of God be with you. I'll see you next time. Bye.